morning. What is the worst sin you have ever committed? It might be something uh, very public. It might be something very private. Uh, it's probably whatever you're most ashamed of. It's, it's probably something that uh, is known by others, but it, not, it might not be. It might even be something that caused others to sin. Um, now, now consider, what, what are some of the most evil acts committed in history? Think about war crimes, the Holocaust, things like that. Is it possible for God to forgive such things as this? Or are sins like this completely unforgivable? We often tend to think of our own sins as, as unforgivable. We allow our guilt to convince us that we are not able to be forgiven, that we don't deserve to be forgiven. And uh, in our own human terms, we think, God can't forgive somebody as evil as me. This morning, uh, we're going to do a bit of a character study. Um, we're going to look at the character of Manasseh, who was one of the kings of Judah. So if you will, turn your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 33. 2 Chronicles chapter 33. And that's where we're going to be for the most part. We're, we're going to look at the parallel accounts to this given in 2 Kings chapter 21 a little bit, but primarily we'll stay in 2 Chronicles chapter 33. And we're going to look at this character, this, this man named Manasseh. Uh, when we look at this person, this king of Judah, what we're going to find is he does more evil than perhaps any other king of Judah. Uh, he, his sins were many, his sins were public, and his sins had a negative impact on the people around him. His sins caused other people to also sin. And so we're going to survey the life of Manasseh, and we're going we're gonna to look, we're going to gain four lessons about the nature of sin. We're going to learn sin is evil, sin has repercussions, you can repent and find forgiveness for your sins, but sins might still have consequences. Four lessons taken from the life of Manasseh about the nature of sin. So just to start off, read with me, starting in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verses 1 through 9. 2 Chronicles 33, verses 1 through 9. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abomination of the nations whom the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down. He also erected altars for the Baals and made ashram and worshipped all of the hosts of heaven and served them. He built altars in the house of the Lord, which the Lord had said, My name shall be in Jerusalem forever. For he built altars for all of the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He made his sons pass through the fire in the valley of ben Hinnom. He practiced witchcraft, used divination, practiced sorcery, and dealt in mediums and spiritualists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to great anger. Then he put carved images of the idols which he had made into the house of the God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen from all of the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will not again remove my foot from Is foot, the foot of Israel from the land which I have appointed for your fathers, if only they observe to do all that I have commanded them according to the law, the statutes, and the ordinances given through Moses." Thus Manasseh misled Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the sons of Israel. If you jump to the parallel account, uh, 2 Kings 21, I'm just going to read verse 16, which gives a little bit more detail. Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood until he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, besides his sins, which made Judah sin in doing evil in the sight of the Lord. We open up reading about Manasseh, and what we get is just a big list of the evil and the sin he committed. And there's a lot here. There's a lot to unpack. Uh, one common theme is just the rampant idolatry of Manasseh. Um, he worshipped seemingly every single idol in, in the Canaanite region. He worshipped all of the false idols, and he didn't worship God. Even worse, he took God out of the temple and put idols in the temple. He replaces God in his own temple and puts in idols. 
Um, his idolatry was rampant. Uh, second thing, we see murder. Uh, the second king passage uh, describes him as, as murdering innocents and having the blood of innocents from one end of Jerusalem to the other. Um, if you look closely at uh, the Second Chronicles chapter 6, it tells us he made his sons pass through the fire of the valley of ben Hinnom. Without getting too graphic, that is child sacrifice. It's describing him killing his own kids. Um, so he murdered many people, many innocents. Uh, again, perhaps even worse, he causes the people of Judah to also commit sin. He makes others sin along with his own sin. Because of him, other people are doing just as wickedly. Under his reign, according to, to verse 9, Israel, or rather Judah, is more sinful than the Canaanite nations that God had completely wiped out. Under the rule of Manasseh, he makes the whole nation just as evil as he is. Uh, we think about this and we read these descriptions and we think, well, the world isn't that bad, but in some ways the world's similar. We look at America and we consider, well, we don't have idols, but we have different forms of idolatry. Uh, I think in America, what we worship more than anything else is probably ourselves. In America, there's this, this sense that I am the most important, I will do what I want, and uh, that is my freedom and my liberty. So, in, in essence, it's worshiping self. That's, that's a rampant idolatry going on in the U.S. Um, I think other people still worship entertainers or sports teams. Uh, how often do you see people with uh, rooms in their houses just dedicated to a team, to the Buckeyes, to the Browns or the Bengals? And in some ways, it's a little bit like a shrine. If you make it more important than God, you've made that an idol. Or the same thing with celebrities. Um, consider how people around us might uh, look at politics. I think you saw a lot of this in the previous election cycles where people will worship a politician and, and make that politician everything about themselves while leaving God out of it. They make that politician into an idol that is greater than God, that is replacing God. Idolatry still exists in the U.S. Um, think about murder. We don't have murder from one end of the city to another, but we still have uh, legal abortion in most of the country. Is that not, in essence, similar to the murder of children? Kind of like, kind of like Manasseh? Um, it, it, even in the U.S., we have plenty of things that cause others to sin. Uh, watch a sitcom, and what you're going to find is uh, dirty jokes that will encourage you to make dirty jokes. You're going to find uh, illicit sexual things that is going to encourage you. Like, these things are fine. Engage. Do what you want. Uh, we have a culture where uh, certain lies are, are forgiven and even accepted and expected. Um, we have a culture that encourages others to worship. To, not to worship, to... to to also engage in sinful acts. That's the place we live in. It might not be as bad as it was for Manasseh, but we would be ignorant to say that we live in a culture that doesn't also engage in sin and encourage sin. And then let's look at ourselves, because we can't leave ourselves out of this. Um, Romans, Romans 3, 23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I opened up by asking, what is your greatest sin? All of you have something. So we can't leave ourselves out of this. We're not innocent. We've also done sinful things. Um, even the holiest, most perfect person among us still has something that they've done. Um, and if one sin makes you fall short of the glory of God, then all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Um, and what we find is nobody, nobody is good. All have sinned and fallen short. And that's the first point that we see. When we look at the life of Manasseh, what we learn about sin is that sin is evil. Sin separates us from God. That's the first thing we learn. The second thing we learn, as we keep reading, is that sin has repercussions. Um, 2 Kings 21, verses 10 through 15. 2 Kings 21, verses 10 through 15. Now the Lord spoke through his servants the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has done these abominations having done wickedly more than all of the Amorites did who were before him, and who has made Judah sin with his idols. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such calamity on Judah and Jerusalem that whoever hears of it, his ears will, his ears will tingle. 
I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria, and I will plummet the house of Ahab, and I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. I will abandon the remnant of my inheritance, and I will deliver them into the hands of their enemy. They will become as plunder and spoil to all of their enemies, because they have done evil in my sight, and they have provoked me to anger since the day of their fathers, since the day their fathers came from Egypt, even to this day. Uh, we jump back to Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles uh, 33 verses 10 and 11. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. Therefore, the Lord brought the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria against them, and they captured Manasseh with hooks and bound him with bronze chains and took him to Babylon. Here we see in the second little section of the account of Manasseh the repercussions of sin. We read all about the sin that, that he had committed, and now we're seeing God punishing him. Uh, why? Again, it, entirely because of the extent of his wickedness. Because of the extent of the wickedness of Judah, he has done so much evil, and Judah has done so much evil, now God is sending Assyria to, to become the destruction of Manasseh and the destruction of Jerusalem and Judea. And so God does. Uh, that's what uh, verse... Uh, Verses 10 and 11 tell us, God allows the armies of the king of Assyria to come in and capture Manasseh. Now, we know a little bit about the Assyrians uh, just from history. And what we learn about the Assyrians in history is that this is a terrible, cruel, and wicked nation known specifically for their brutality and their cruelty. Uh, when it says Manasseh is led away in uh, hooks, uh, that's literal without getting into too much more detail. Um, but remember now, under Manasseh's reign, Judah is more wicked than the Assyrians. And so God leads them away. It, it's, it's a basic cause and effect in many ways. Uh, if I were to go out and walk into traffic and I got hit by a car, that's the consequences of my actions. If I uh, mouth off to my boss and I get fired, that's the consequence of my actions. If I go and I rob a bank and I am arrested and I'm thrown in prison... That's the consequence of my actions. It makes sense to us. We understand what happens when we do something we shouldn't. And so there's repercussions for our sin as well. Uh, we read in Romans 6, Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. God gives us a clear consequence for our sin, and that is spiritual death. Um, even when there's not an immediate physical consequence to our sin, we understand the presence of of spiritual consequence and spiritual death. Uh, all who have sinned have separated themselves from God. All who are separated from God don't have a hope of eternity. Um, if we have sin in our lives and we are separated from God, if we have separated ourselves from God, then we are, in, in fact, doomed. And that is the second lesson we learn from Manasseh about sin. Sin is evil, and sin has repercussions. But the third lesson we learn when we read the account of Manasseh is that sin, you can repent from your sin, and you can find forgiveness. Let's keep reading. 2 Chronicles 33, verses 12 and 13. When Manasseh was in distress, he entreated the Lord his God, and he humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. When he prayed to God, God was moved by his entreaty, heard his supplication, and brought him to Jerusalem, back to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. So what does Manasseh do? Well, Manasseh repents. Manasseh entreats God for help, and God delivers. Uh, this, this word entreat, this is the idea of earnestly seeking the favor of God. Manasseh turns his life around, he repents, and he does this by earnestly seeking the favor of God. And we see him do this. Uh, we see him first have a true change of heart. This isn't a man asking, Lord, please take away these consequences. Lord, please restore me so that I can continue to do whatever sinful thing I want to do. This is a man who has changed his heart. We see him uh, entreat God with his humility. Again, not the prideful king doing whatever he wanted, but uh, a man who has been humbled to his lowest low. A man in captivity, in the, in the clutches of a cruel Assyrian army brought to his lowest, now understanding humility. 
uh, we see him entreat God, again, with true repentance. And that is proven by his actions. As we continue to read his account, we'll see. It's not a false repentance. It's true repentance in which he changes. He changes his life, and he continues to uh, put the past self behind him and move forward trying to do good. And he entreats God directly with prayer. He directly asks God for deliverance. And the craziest thing about this account is God delivers him. Manasseh, this, this most sinful king of Judah, who's done all of these things, turns his life around, and God completely restores him. Uh, verse 13 is one of those verses where like, just a sentence kind of skips over something significant. Um, God was moved by his entreaty, heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem to his kingdom. How? Doesn't say how. But somehow, God causes Manasseh to be freed, Manasseh to be returned to Jerusalem, and when he returns to Jerusalem, he's still king. It doesn't say how. That's one of those things, one of those questions where how in the world does this happen? But that's what God does. God completely restores Manasseh to become king of Judah, uh, releases him from captivity, and brings him back. Um, God recognized Manasseh's truly repentant heart and fully restores Manasseh to what he once was. Um, and frankly, all of us, I think, should be able to uh, identify a little bit with Manasseh. Anybody who has been saved, anybody who has repented and been baptized in Christ understands what it means to be at this lowest low. Because all of us were at that lowest low at one point. All of us were lost in our sin with no hope, lost in spiritual death, and, and doomed to hell is what we were. But we didn't stay there. Manasseh didn't have to stay there, and we didn't have to stay there either. Um, none of us had to stay in that state. Uh, turn with me to Romans. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, I think, describes the state that we are in. Uh, Romans chapter 6, we're going to read verses 4 through 8. Therefore, we have been buried with Christ through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we are no longer slaves to sin. For he who has died is free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we now shall also live with him. Uh, if you go to Romans 8, 1 and 2, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Uh, when we turn to God, when we repent and when we put on Jesus in baptism, our sins are taken away from us, and we are forgiven. And this involves repentance. This involves turning away from the wickedness that we had committed. No longer living that life of sin, no longer striving to commit sin, but instead striving to do the opposite. Striving to walk away and no longer do as we once did. Um, when we are baptized into Christ, he takes away our body of sin. Now, understand, this has to be a true repentance, a true turning to God. Like Manasseh, it has to be an understanding that we aren't going back to, to go do whatever wickedness we want to do. It's, it's turning to God and allowing God to lead us. It's true repentance, acknowledging the wrong we've done, and making honest efforts and attempts, honest efforts with the intent to move away from our sin in the future. Focus in a little bit more on verse 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so we are no longer slaves to sin. Second thing I would really want to emphasize here is that there is no sin that cannot be forgiven by God. What is your greatest sin? It doesn't matter. God can forgive it, and God will forgive it. It was true for Manasseh, and it can be true for you too. There is no sin so great that God cannot forgive it. And that's the third lesson we learned from Manasseh. Sin is evil, and sin has repercussions. But you can repent and find forgiveness of your sins. Let's look at one more thing near the end of Manasseh's life. Uh, let's read 2 Chronicles 33, verses 14 through 20. 
Now, after this, Manasseh built the outer wall of the city of David on the west side of the Gahan in the valley, even to the entrance of the fish gate. And he encircled the Ophel with it and made it very high. And he put army commanders in all the fortified cities of Judah. He also removed the foreign gods and the idols from the house of the Lord, as well as all the altars which he had built on the mountain of the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. And he threw them outside the city. And he set up altars to, of the Lord, and he sacrificed peace offerings and thank offerings on it. And he ordered Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Nonetheless, the people still sacrificed in the high places, although only to the Lord their God. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh, even his prayer to his God, and the words of the seers who spoke to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel, behold, they are among the records of the kings of Israel. His prayer also, and how God was entreated by him, and all of his sin and his unfaithfulness, and the sites on which he built high places and erected ashram, and the carved images before he humbled himself. Behold, they are written in the records of Hosea. Hosea. And Manasseh slept with his fathers, and they buried him in his own house. And Ammon his son became king in his place. We see the repentance of Manasseh in this final section. In this final section, we're going to see what it means to repent, but we're also going to see sin still has consequences, even if it's forgiven. Uh, first of all, we see what Manasseh does. He tries to make things better, and he does make things better. When he repents, what does he do? Well, he destroys all of the idols. He removes the idols from the temple, and he restores God to the temple. He tries his best to make up for the evil he had done. Uh, he rebuilds Jerusalem's walls and armies. Again, we don't hear much about this Assyrian attack, but the Assyrians attacked. They destroyed the armies, they destroyed the walls, and now Manasseh is rebuilding what was destroyed. Uh, we see that he's giving sacrifices to God, proper sacrifices, peace offerings and uh, thanks offerings. He's offering proper worship to God. Um, and he orders the rest of Judah, worship God only. He does good, and he does a lot of good. He repents but there's still consequences. He still faces the consequences of everything, he's fa of everything that he's done. Those people he killed, when the blood of the innocent uh, went from one end of Jerusalem to the other, all still dead. Those kids he sacrificed, all still dead. Um, Judah is still sacrificing on the high places. So even though he restores most of proper worship, it's not perfect. There's still a little bit of bad worship going on. And if you continue reading in uh, the next chapter, we're going to learn that God still is going to punish the nation for its evil. Judah is still a corrupt nation, even after all this. And God's going to continue to, to bring about Babylonian captivity here in the future because of the sin of the people. Despite God's forgiveness, despite God's forgiveness and despite Manasseh's great intentions, not everything works out for the best. Uh, there is still previous damage and previous hurt from his actions. Um, and it's true for us as well. Repentance and forgiveness takes away our spiritual consequences, but it doesn't always take away the physical consequences of our actions. Uh, we consider uh, two kids who, who get pregnant without being married. They can find forgiveness, and they will be granted forgiveness, but they're still a baby. Uh, a drunk driver uh, gets wasted and crashes into something. Well, he can find forgiveness, but the car is still totaled. I rob a bank. I can find forgiveness, but I'm still going to jail. Forgiveness does not necessarily take away consequences, and that is a truth about sin that we have to learn. It's true for Manasseh, and it's true for us. Uh, Galatians 6, Galatians 6, 7 and 8 tells us, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. That is true spiritually. It is true physically. Um, and so that's what we learn. Just because God can forgive our sins, and he will forgive our sins, does not mean we won't have consequences for our actions. Um, and so that leaves us with responsibility. We are responsible to do our very best to make up for what we have done in this life. Um, we are responsible to do our best, given the consequences we face, to be righteous with those consequences. Our repentance is shown by our actions. It's, it's being responsible for what you've done. That's what we're called to do. So we look at Manasseh. We look at this, this uh, wicked man, and we find a lot of truth here. We find a lot about sin. Sin is evil. Sin has repercussions. 
you can repent of your sin and find forgiveness, but you will still face consequences for your sin. Um, that's what we learned from Manasseh. So as, as we conclude, I think I really want to reinforce the primary teaching here. God has enough forgiveness to forgive each and every one of us. No matter what you've done in the past, you can find forgiveness. Uh, it was true for Manasseh. If God can forgive Manasseh, God can forgive you too. There is no sin too great that God cannot forgive it. It's true for Manasseh. It was true for Manasseh's terrible sin. And it is true for you as well. If God can forgive Manasseh, God can forgive you. God forgives all who humbly repent and return to him, are baptized into his son, and live righteously. It has to be a true repentance. It was true for Manasseh, and it is true for us as well. All of us have to strive for that humble heart of true repentance and allow God to take away our sin. So this morning, if there's some of you who have sin in your life, you need to understand that in many ways you are like Manasseh at your lowest low. Please take this opportunity. Uh, put on Christ in baptism. Allow him to put to death your body of sin so that you can be raised anew. That you can have that body of sin erased. Some of you probably have your sins erased. You are completely forgiven, but you're still holding on to that guilt. Now, my encouragement this morning is, let it go. If God can forgive Manasseh, God can forgive you too. Even if you can't, God can. There is no sin so great that God cannot forgive. It's a message of hope. It's a message of, of turning your life around. Because if you haven't repented, take this opportunity. Uh, we're here for you as the church. If you have any of these needs, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.